benvenuti a tutti, grazie di aver eh, accettato eh, l'invito di partecipare, di seguire eh, questo webinar che è l'ultimo eh, di un ciclo eh, organizzato dall'Istituto Bruno Leoni in collaborazione con eh, UPS e dedicato ad affrontare eh, il, eh, il modo in cui eh, stiamo eh, affrontando e uscendo dalla pandemia il, la prospettiva eh, di chi eh, ha consentito eh, di convivere con la pandemia e, e, e avrà anche delle responsabilità nella gestione della logistica vaccinale e, ehm, e, 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 e ci consentirà di guardare avanti e di capire come le cose eh, potranno evolvere. Quest'ultimo webinar è dedicato al dopo la pandemia e in particolare al ruolo del G20. Um, gran parte del webinar si svolgerà in inglese, alcuni speaker interverranno in italiano, altri in inglese, eh, quindi eh, sarà un po' una sorta di melting pot linguistico eh, in forza del quale I uh, switch to English uh, in order to uh, introduce uh, our first speaker. Uh, like uh, the other webinars uh, in, this, uh, in this series, even this one is opened by a, a sort of keynote speech Um, which will be delivered today by Simon Ivanet. Uh, Simon is a very good friend uh, of, of Istituto Bruno Leoni. He's been uh, our guest uh, uh, quite a few times. Uh, unfortunately, this time only uh, online, but we hope um, to have him uh, as well as anybody else, our uh, guests in a physical meeting anytime soon. Uh, Simon, Simon is a professor of economics at the University of St. Gallen uh, in, uh, in Switzerland uh, and he is also the coordinator of the project Go Global Trade Alert uh, that uh, uh, takes into account and monitors uh, all of the pro and anti-trade measures which are taken over time in the member states of the G20. So he is the perfect person uh, to, to address Uh, what the G20 is expected to, to discuss, first of all, and perhaps to, to deliver uh, in a um, delicate and, and peculiar time like this one. So I will uh, leave immediately the floor to, to Simon Ivanet. So thank you very much. And, and later after uh, Simon, uh, Simon's uh, speech, we will have a round table Uh, with Cristina Falcone, who is Vice President Public Affairs for UPS Europe, Alberto Mingardi, whom most people uh, probably already know if you are following this webinar because he's the Director General of Istituto Bruno Leoni, uh, Alessandro Modiano, who is the Deputy Director General for Global Affairs uh, in the um, Direction General about Mondialization in Italy's Ministry of Public of Foreign Affairs, and finally, uh, Lia Quartapelle, who is also a, a very good friend of Istituto Bruno Leone and he's a, she's a member uh, of the Chamber of Deputy and particularly of the Foreign Affairs Committee as well as a, a scholar in, in foreign relations. Uh, so uh, Simon, you have the floor and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Carlo, for that very kind in, introduction and it's uh, great to be able to contribute to yet another one of your uh, sessions. I must also say that, as you said, It's a great shame that we cannot be here in person, but uh, uh, we will uh, find another opportunity, I'm sure, as well. Now, as you know, this is a very special year for Italy as the uh, president of the G20, and uh, we hope and wish every Italy all the best of luck, but the circumstances are difficult, and my presentation will try and summarize uh, what uh, challenges face ahead and what potential possibilities there are for G the G20. So let me pull up my slides, uh, which I have. I only have a few. Um, so I'm going to discuss the G20, the trade, and you know the, uh, the post-pandemic world was the uh, title I was given. Uh, I, this may be a little bit optimistic because we are still in the pandemic world and we need to get to the uh, post-pandemic world. But still, I, you know, we are on the way with the uh, vaccines and alike. And uh, so it is worth thinking about how we could shape trade relations now as well as after the pandemic is over. So my uh, talk um, my talk is the following. I have the following issues. Please ignore the title. I, I forgot to eliminate it from a previous slide. Uh, so this is the table of contents for this talk. The basic premises of, of my talk is going to be the following, which is that crises create scars. 
uh, and uh, we are likely to be dealing with those scars for a number of years to come. And one of the challenges for the G20 will be uh, to what extent it can address the medium and longer term consequences of the pandemic. There is a implicit working assumption amongst many trade policy analysts that and government officials that when you have a crisis uh, governments intervene the economy is restored and then we carry on as if nothing has happened well the last big crisis we had was with the global financial crisis and uh, whilst we did not get some 1930 star protectionism we saw so much subsidization in traded goods industries uh, that uh, over time the level of uh, trade distortions in the world economy significantly increased and was not reversed and those scars were are still here today and indeed that increased um, subsidization became a source of trade tensions it was something that donald trump highlighted to many uh, in many of his speeches not that i'm a fan of him but uh, the simple fact is he did notice that there was long-term consequences uh, in the trading system and i'm afraid most of the trade policy officials and the G20 uh, officials at the time didn't want to address this reality. So what I'm going to do in this talk is so that we don't avoid the reality, I'm going to identify where are these scars going to come from. I'm going to point to three areas in medical goods, in vaccines, and in the, the trade related aspects of the macroeconomic response that countries had uh, at the beginning of the pandemic and during the pandemic. And what I want to argue is, unless we are careful, these three interventions will have longer term effects. They are not going to have some short term effects which will go away. If we want them to go away, we have to take actions to get rid of these uh, negative impacts of these uh, policies, or rather the side effects of these policies. This then helps me discuss what are the challenges uh, facing the G20. So let's start with the first of the scars uh, which I want to talk about. And this is policies towards trade policies towards medical goods. Now, as Carlo highlighted, we, um, we collect very detailed data on what governments are doing in the area of trade and medical goods. We also collect it in the area of food as well. The, uh, but uh, here are the results are going to be only for medical goods. The amount of information we collect is multiples of what the uh, international public organizations collect. And that's important because the picture you get in some of their reports is quite frankly selective and possibly misleading. So what, do, what does a forensic data collection job show? It shows some good news and some bad news. The good news on the left-hand side is, and if you look at uh, from the period from the beginning of last year, and this chart shows you the new policy interventions which came into force and when they are phased out, we can see that there were a huge number of import reforms introduced last year uh, for medical goods. In fact, the maximum, the peak number was 196 import reforms, which were put in place by the end of the second quarter of last year. We've seen some of those import reforms be removed, but still there's 162 of them last month, or rather this month, which are still in effect. So this is a permanent easing of uh, or this, if this continues, it will be a, a permanent easing in the trade um, in the uh, trade in medical goods, which is good news. The bad news is that we also saw last year a surge in the number of export curbs. These could have been export bans, they could be export authorization regimes, uh, they can come in lots of different forms. And we saw 138 of those uh, implemented. And they have they have uh, begun to phase out, but there are still 92 of them left. And if they stay in place, this will uh, permanently change the possibilities for exporting around the world. In addition, we have 60 import curbs or import restrictions which have been tracked in the area of medical goods as well. And this number does not seem to be falling over time. So what you can see here then is that uh, it's quite possible that at the end of the pandemic, we will have a permanent change in trade policy in the medical goods sector. Some of those changes are good, but a lot of them are bad. And so the question will be, uh, if we want to go back to the status quo before the pandemic, how are we going to get there? On the right hand side, I show you the total number of countries which are involved in all of these um, 
uh, in imposing these different types of policy measures. And you can see that it's concentrated in about 20 to 25 countries which are responsible. Many of them are G20 members. So it ought to be possible to coordinate some type of phase down if we were serious about doing this. But if we don't do this, we are looking at a profound change, I think, in the trade policy in medical goods. And this will start affecting private sector investment behavior. Most European nations are too small to sustain large production uh, facilities solely from the national market. Their firms need to be able to export. And those firms that need to be able to export are unlikely to invest in countries which have put in place export bans. And so this period is, is not going to be forgotten. If anyone thinks that an export ban or an export authorization regime is a temporary impediment that the private sector is uh, likely to ignore, then they are not talking to the same private sector people that I talk to. They are well aware of this and they're not going to forget it. So this is the first potential scar that we have to worry about. The second scar that we have to worry about has to do with vaccine nationalism. And here, this vaccine nationalism often takes the form of diverting production of vaccines to home needs, even if the production was paid for by someone else in a foreign country. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, essentially uh, uh, redirecting production or redirecting sales. Now, at the moment, there is no country in the world which has a formal export ban. But there are plenty of countries which have informal arrangements which curb exports. And uh, we have the case of the United States and the UK using uh, essentially uh, their government procurement of vaccines, uh, I think, to uh, limit exports. We have the case of the European Union with its export authorization regime. And we have the case of India, which is very important because it's the biggest producer of uh, vaccines largely for de the developing world. Uh, but uh, the Indians have also put in place a uh, informal export ban since the beginning of this month. And the chart on the left shows you the shipments out of India uh, from the middle of January through to the middle of, um, uh, of uh, or sorry, through to today. And you can see, I've put in a seven day moving average. There's a collapse in the moving average at the beginning of March. This coincides with a surge in COVID infections in India. And uh, I have, um, on, on four occasions, I can document statements by Indian officials where they have linked the exportation of vaccines to the domestic uh, infection situation and the need for vaccination. So these are statements which Indian officials have made. They have made the linkage, not me. And so what we have seen then is a collapse in the number of Indian exports. And of course, this is important because many developing countries depend on Indian exports, but not just developing countries. Canada, as well as uh, the UK also, were counting on uh, exports from India. So this vaccine nationalism will have knock-on effects. And uh, this uh, the knock-on effects, as we have seen in Europe, with the disagreements between London and Brussels, this leads to some uh, pretty bad relations between countries and is likely to lead to sustained distrust. Now, with respect to developments in Europe, we, are, we have, uh, of course, the European Union last year took the lead in trying to promote a trade and health initiative at the World Trade Organization and as part of the Ottawa Group. Now, I have to say uh, the following, which is that given the export authorization regime put in place by the European Union uh, uh, in January, its renewal recently, and then its uh, revision recently too, um, the European Union's credibility in the area of trade and health is shredded. It's over, okay? And so the proposals to facilitate um, a trade in healthcare products, which the Commission put out in June, the reason I have a red line through them is because uh, the, Euro the EU unfortunately has lost credibility in this area, okay? More generally, what we have seen is that whenever the issue of trade policy and health products comes up, uh, we get some interesting and good ideas put on the table, but over time, somehow, all those good ideas get taken away through opposition from different players, and often the big players. And so one important question, which we, I'm sure we can discuss in the Q&A, is the extent to which the G20 can do any, uh, anything in the area of trade and public health, given that it is full of big players. Uh, but still, 
uh, there is, a, and that's an open question for us to come back to. But still, the, uh, my second point here is that the vaccine nationalism that we are seeing in various parts of the world is creating lots of uh, enemies and uh, distrust, and it will be very hard to reconstruct uh, cooperation between nations uh, on this. It's hard for countries to say, trust me, when last year you were uh, preventing that, uh, a foreign country from importing vaccines. So this, uh, these export bans will have a negative effect on trade cooperation. And since uh, Italy is in charge of uh, the G20 this year, that ought to be a concern uh, for uh, our friends in Rome. Now, the third um, way in which we can have fallout uh, from the uh, pandemic is in the nature of the policy responses last year. And as Carlo knows, we actively monitor these as well. We collect lots of information. And uh, what we did last year was to systematically compare how countries um, responded to the global financial crisis uh, 10 years ago versus now. And so what we have on the left-hand side for each of the G20 countries is, what is the percentage of their policy interventions last, uh, sorry, in the last crisis, which harmed trading partners? So that's on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is the percentage of policy measures last year, which uh, harm trading partners. And if the countries are dotted along the 45 degree line, it shows that their policy responses this year and last, the last year and in the last crisis were the same. That is not the case. What we have is some, we have a group of countries this time round who've put in place much more restrictive policies, much more protectionist policies than last time around. So these are policy interventions which harm trading partners. They may not be designed to harm the trading partners, but they have knock on effects. And so we have countries like Japan and Canada and Korea. Uh, uh, these are countries where compared to 10 years ago, their public policy response this time around was much more protectionist. So was the case of South Africa. Interestingly, we have countries like Brazil and Argentina, whose public policy response this year was, sorry, last year was uh, much more liberalizing than it was 10 years ago. Now, what's important about this particular chart is that it destroys the argument that all governments are tempted to engage in protectionism during crises. It's very clear that governments differ a lot in terms of how much they've resorted to protectionism, which begs the question then, can we figure out ways in which countries can effectively fight economic slumps and uh, uh, economic downturns without harming their trading partners as much? That is the key question. The second question we want to ask is, can they do that in a way which is temporary? And this is where the chart on the right-hand side is important, because what it shows is for each of the G20 countries, what percentage of their policy interventions last year were temporary and when they would be unwound. Now, uh, in uh, November of last year, when we put this chart together just before the G20 summit uh, uh, last year, the country which had unwound the most of its protectionism last year was Russia, not a country we normally associate with good trade policy. Okay. Interestingly, if they, if they follow through with their plans to unwind protectionism on the dates that they've announced, it will be the Chinese which will unwind more of their trade distortions than anyone else. And so you can see there are big differences across countries in how much they resort to temporary protectionism. Now, why is this important? Because you may remember the G20 committed uh, that they would only engage in protectionism, which was temporary, proportionate, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out that some G20 countries are better at that than others. And the interesting question is, quite frankly, if the, if the Chinese and the Russians can uh, put in place policy mixes which counter the pandemic uh, that are temporary, why can't Italy, Germany, France, uh, and other countries that I could name. And so what uh, this reinforces the basic point, the countries have a choice when they de decide how to fight crises. And it's not, it should not be the default assumption that everyone does protectionism by the same degree. That's not true. Countries differ. And what we should be doing is learning from those countries' responses to figure out how to intervene in markets and protect our economies without harming our trading partners as much. 
That then leads then to uh, what are the challenges that the G20 face? Quite frankly, there are four. The first is to stop matters from getting worse. Uh, that is by uh, stopping the resort to vaccine nationalism, possibly through peer pressure. And uh, I must tell you, having looked back on the G20 now for over 10 years, and I've tracked pretty much every G20 summit, the one G20 summit where, uh, there were, where progress was made on this was the G20 summit where uh, one country decided to openly criticize another country's protectionism. And this actually created a debate which then uh, was very useful. And uh, this all happened in the Toronto G20 summit when the Canadians openly criticized the Russians for their protectionism. And this then led to, uh, obviously the Russians got upset, but then everyone had a discussion about, well, okay, we really should be stopping protectionism. The temptation of the G20 for much of its existence has been to turn a blind eye to protectionism. As one senior trade policy maker put it to me, the G20 does not do peer pressure, it does peer protection, okay? Uh, and uh, that is uh, not a good model to follow. The second challenge is to unwind as many of these uh, policy interventions as possible. Many, if countries are following the G20 uh, mandate, they should be implementing temporary policies. And what we should be doing is encouraging countries to unwind those temporary policies once their economies recover. The third thing we should be doing is looking at the crisis response last year and 10 years ago to ask what are the best ways to fight economic crises without harming trading partners as much. Since countries differ in how much they resort to protectionism, there must be some countries which are putting together effective packages with more protection versus less protectionism. And so what we should be doing is trying to establish best practices. These best practices do not have to be binding rules. They can be suggestions about how to manage crisis response by big trading nations such as the G20 members. And the last suggestion is that the World Trade Organization was very slow to gear up uh, during the pandemic. It, it uh, took time for it to uh, be able to uh, be, a, be able to produce useful analysis, collect information on what uh, countries were doing, publish that information. It also took a long time to get its administrative functions back working. So this organization needs a crisis management protocol uh, so that when the next crisis happens, it can uh, respond more quickly. And let's be clear, the World Health Organization has crisis management protocols. So there is precedent for this. So why can't the World Trade Organization do this? And we have a new energetic uh, uh, director general of the WTO, and it would be excellent if she were given a mandate to come up with an intelligent, well thought through crisis management protocol for that organization, which would then build confidence that uh, someone is looking very carefully after the world trading system when we get into the next crisis. Let me stop there and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I think you, you, you have put forward a, a number of very relevant issues uh, and you have provided us uh, with, with the big picture uh, of the uh, uh, world uh, we are living. Uh, also, uh, thank you for your remarks about the, the, the stance of the European Union vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the challenges of trade in general and, and trade in health products in particular. Um, I think this is the, 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 the best person to, to hand over uh, the floor uh, is Alessandro Modiano, who is here uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I switch to Italian. Uh, uh, Alessandro Modiano, che rappresenta il Ministero uh, degli Affari Esteri e, e, e che quindi in qualche maniera uh, è la voce della Presidenza. Uh, del, di questo G20. E quindi la domanda che io uh, girerei al dottor, al direttore Modiano, ringraziandolo per aver accettato il nostro invito, è se ci può raccontare quali sono le priorità uh, della presidenza italiana, anche rispetto chiaramente ai temi sollevati da, da Simon Ivenet. Uh, grazie mille, alla parola. Uh, grazie mille, thank you very much. I don't know if, uh, well, I can switch from English to Italian, from it's small as the same. Uh, yes, I am uh, the Deputy Director General for Global Affairs here in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And of course, uh, this year we are very, very deeply involved in the organization 
of the G20 presidency, of the Italian G20 presidency, and uh, I wouldn't imagine a more difficult time to organize a presidency of the G20, uh, of course, because of the pandemic, and, and also because uh, I, together with the pandemic, there are also all the other global challenges that, that are still there, uh, that, that maybe because of the pandemic, they got worse in the last in the last in the last year so um from our point of view uh we we had to change a little bit the the objectives of the presidency uh, we have to we have to start from the pandemic and and the pandemic is actually going across all the other global challenges of uh, of the presidency said that um just a couple of major let's say general consideration of what uh, uh professor ever was saying before uh, of course, uh, when we talk about trade, uh, the, the, let's say that the, I, I would say that the negative trend of international trade started before the pandemic and the crisis of WTO, it's, it's, it's quite an old crisis. And, um, and so uh, to deal with that crisis, because we, we do think that one of the turning point uh, to uh, create better conditions for free international trade, is the reform of the WTO. And from that point of view, it's been quite frustrating in the last few years. I, I started to do this work three years ago and I went through three different summits, G20 summits, and every time we, we put into the final communique the need to reform the WTO and then we're not able to do that. So from that point of view, this is really frustrating. And of course, the challenge of a reform of WTO it's on from one hand, it's a turning point to uh, have better conditions for free international trade. But at the same point, uh, uh, it seems that it's becoming more and more difficult to find a common ground and, and to find a common language uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, achieve this, this very important reform. So from this point of view, uh, of course, one of the main efforts that the Italian presidency is actually putting in the, in the uh, uh, trade, uh, uh, track is exactly the reform of the WTO, and we are trying to. Uh, we just had the first uh, working group on trade and investment, and of course, one of the main points is that one. I, to be very frank, at, at least at the moment, I don't see a significant uh, step forward. Uh, but we are we are at least more confident that maybe in the next few months, particularly because of the or a different attitude from one of the main actors. It might, we might have some, some good news, but the work is still going on. Uh, but as, as I said before, a reform of the WTO is a key point. And, uh, and we're working hard on that, on that part. Uh, secondly, uh, when we talk about uh, protectionism, particularly uh, when we involve European camp, well, European Union members in this debate, we must take into account that we, don't, we completely lost our autonomy in terms of uh, uh, trade policy as a member of the European Union, talking about Italy and all the other European Union members that are represented inside the, the, the G20. So uh, from this point of view, it's quite difficult to say what is, uh, in, for example, the Italian policy in terms of foreign trade, because we are 100% inside the European Union system and European Union context, we are not independent from their point of view. Um, diciamo, passo all'italiano, eh, per quanto riguarda le priorità del, eh, del, um, della presidenza italiana del G20, come dicevo prima, il punto di partenza è la pandemia. Io credo che da questo punto di vista, e nonostante evidentemente gli enormi problemi che dobbiamo affrontare, una considerazione che appare sempre un po' eh, retorica, ma che secondo me non è retorica, è che se non altro la pandemia ci ha dato una fortissima indicazione dal punto di vista dell'efficacia dell del multilateralismo per affrontare sfide globali come una pandemia. Noi possiamo fare eh, obiettivamente un'enorme quantità di osservazioni critiche sulla gestione, ad esempio, dei vaccini, ed è stato fatto in parte correttamente nell'intervento che mi ha preceduto. Però un dato è fondamentale, eh, la, la decisione e l'appello che il G20 in particolare ha lanciato nell'aprile del 2020 eh, per creare delle condizioni, eh, diciamo così, appropriate per eh, ottenere un vaccino in poco tempo e quindi eh, per ottenerlo, eh, passare attraverso una, un flusso di finanziamenti 
estremamente massiccio che in effetti è stato in gran parte garantito, questo ha avuto come risultato che, eh, ripeto, al di là delle polemiche, i vaccini sono stati trovati in, in meno di un anno, sono in corso di distribuzione, i sistemi di distribuzione sono pieni di difetti e lo vediamo quotidianamente, però non dimentichiamoci che è la prima volta nella storia che eh, un vaccino di fronte a un virus di questa portata è stato identificato e distribuito in fin dei conti in pochi mesi. Questo è, secondo noi, un successo del multilateralismo, nel senso che se non ci fosse stata unità di intenti, unità di finanziamenti e in qualche modo strumenti condivisi poi per, per gestire eh, la scoperta e la distribuzione dei, dei vaccini, di fatto non, avremmo, non saremmo certo a questo punto e non, potremmo, non saremmo nelle condizioni di vedere una luce alla fine del tunnel del Covid. Questo è, io credo, un successo del multilateralismo e va registrato in quanto tale. Ora, quindi, noi sulla parte, diciamo, sanità, continueremo su due piani ad agire come presidenza G20. Sul primo piano, che è quello della gestione dell'emergenza della pandemia Covid-19, e questo ha a che fare anche con l'organizzazione del Global Health Summit che, ci sarà, che si svolgerà auspicabilmente in presenza a Roma il 21 maggio, e in quel contesto eh, il focus sarà duplice. Da una parte, continuare a gestire l'emergenza Covid-19, e dall'altra creare delle condizioni eh, o, diciamo, ottimali per mettere il mondo eh, in condizioni di poter affrontare in futuro altre pandemie. Perché quello che in effetti eh, abbiamo, ahimè, scoperto eh, e, pagato, e, e che abbiamo poi pagato con un prezzo altissimo è che il mondo non era preparato né ovviamente nella sua parte più debole, ma tantomeno nella sua parte più ricca e più eh, prospera ad affrontare pandemie di questo genere. Quindi, L'idea del Global Health Summit è di trovare eh, dei sistemi, co condividere dei sistemi che possano mettere eh, i paesi nelle condizioni di affrontare meglio pandemie come molto probabilmente ai ci saranno e che ci hanno colto veramente di sorpresa. Quindi il primo scopo del vertice, diciamo, del, della presenza italiana G20, al di là poi delle, delle tre P, che possiamo andare poi a discutere, dei People, Planet and Prosperity, in realtà è come affrontare la pandemia e come continuare a affrontarla, ma come creare le condizioni affinché ci siano, siamo meglio preparati in futuro per affrontare eventi di questo genere. Dopodiché, tenendo sempre presente, tenendo sempre a mente un fattore che secondo me sfugge poi un po' alla pubblica opinione, il G20 è un contesto eh, con dentro eh, l'80% dei paesi che, che rappresentano l'80% del GDP mondiale il 75% del commercio mondiale e via discorrendo. Tutto questo ha un prezzo, che evidentemente sono paesi molto diversi, con priorità diverse, con strategie di sviluppo diverse e eh, il G20 decide in base al consenso. Eh, se non sono tutti quanti d'accordo, non produce un bel niente. Quindi, ahimè, quando si, diciamo, si critica e, ed è perfettamente comprensibile la difficoltà che a volte il G20 dimostra in adottare se non decisioni o orientamenti in qualche modo significativi la difficoltà è tutta uh, sul, sul, sul funzionamento del G20 cioè che qualsiasi cosa venga poi prodotta deve avere il consenso di tutti ora voi sapete meglio di me che il consenso di paesi come Cina, Stati Uniti, Russia, Turchia, l'Unione Europea eccetera è difficilissimo da trovare quindi lo sforzo è quello di in un contesto multilaterale che a noi continua ad apparire come l'unico modo per affrontare le cosiddette global challenges, eh, il consenso implica che eh, le ambizioni debbano necessariamente diminuire. Su questo c'è poca discussione da fare. Il successo di un G20 si misura su quanto le ambizioni le cercano di... su quanto queste ambizioni possono rimanere effettivamente di un certo livello, ma certamente sarà un livello più basso, ad esempio, in un contesto come il G7, dove la like-mindedness è molto più elevata. Questo va sempre tenuto presente. Poi due, due parole, veramente è difficile condensare in un intervento di pochi minuti le priorità della nostra Presidenza. È una Presidenza che parte da un presupposto anche quello un po' trito e ritrito, ma che secondo me è necessario ripetere, e cioè la pandemia è una tragedia che però ci, dà, ci sta dando la possibilità di ripensare alcune cose e di impostarle per il futuro in maniera più, uh, più appropriata. Ed è il concetto di build back better, cioè di cercare di non di ritornare al passato, ma di costruire un futuro che sia più a misura sia dell'essere umano sia del pianeta. Io credo che da questo punto di vista l'iniezione diciamo, di, ahimè, 
drammatica eh, consapevolezza di quello che sono le global challenges che ci ha innescato in qualche modo la pandemia ha se non altro avuto l'effetto positivo di far capire che i processi di ricostruzione dovranno essere obiettivamente basati su paradigmi diversi. Da una parte l'essere umano al centro e dall'altra il pianeta al centro. Sono sfide esistenziali, non possiamo perdere tempo, in particolare quella del pianeta è una sfida che non ci, non, non ci lascia più alternative, dobbiamo affrontarla nel modo giusto. E quindi l'Italia si concentrerà da una parte su politiche appunto che siano intorno all'essere umano e che garantiscano in qualche modo, che facilitino il fatto che l'essere umano di fronte alla globalizzazione non venga lasciato solo e che il pianeta allo stesso tempo non venga lasciato a, ai trend che sono ormai consolidati da anni e che quindi eh, dobbiamo trovare un sistema per convivere meglio fra esseri umani e pianeta. E su questo la consapevolezza è fortissima. L'Italia, fra l'altro, gioca un ruolo fondamentale perché allo stesso tempo è anche co-presidente della COP26, e cioè di quella conferenza che si dedicherà interamente alla, alle, ai cosiddetti, eh, ai, ai, agli obiettivi che sono stati approvati ma non ancora applicati dall'Accordo di Parigi del 2015. Quindi da questo punto di vista giocheremo un ruolo, un ruolo fondamentale. L'ultimo aspetto, Prosperity, ha a che fare evidentemente sia con tutte le tematiche del commercio e quindi quello che abbiamo detto poco fa, sia col eh, cercare di trovare strumenti per meglio adattare l'innovazione tecnologica, la digitalizzazione, l'intelligenza artificiale eh, al mondo del lavoro e, e questa è un'altra sfida enorme che tra l'altro nel nostro caso coinvolge le piccole e medie imprese e via discorrendo perché abbiamo perfettamente capito che queste sono sfide che eh, se lasciate da sole eh, offrono grandi, grandi vantaggi ad alcuni e grandissimi svantaggi a tanti altri e quindi vanno obiettivamente gestite in modo che le opportunità che offrono eh, che offre l'innovazione tecnologica in senso lato siano opportunità distribuite equamente e che non lasciano come si usa dire indietro nessuno io farei intanto questo intervento introduttivo poi a mano a mano eventualmente la discussione immagino si svilupperà su varie eh, direttrici grazie Grazie mille direttore, poi naturalmente nel secondo e breve giro di, di, di tavolo prendiamo anche spunto dalle eventuali domande che arrivano dal, dal pubblico. Um, I switch back to English. Uh, um, I will uh, uh, introduce now uh, Lia Quartapelle. Lia is a, a member of the Chamber of Deputy. Um, she's also an expert of foreign affairs and foreign relations. And, and by the way, I think of African economics for, for she, she studied African economics for some time uh, in, in her life. Um, so, uh, Leah, I, I, I think that uh, a number of issues uh, have emerged uh, in uh, Simon's and, and uh, Alessandro's uh, speeches. So uh, please let us know what are your thoughts. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I will try to put the video on, but uh, I'm not entirely sure whether the connection here, uh, the network here in the, in the house uh, can support video and voice, but uh, we will see. Um, well, uh, first thing, um, we shouldn't consider, from an Italian perspective, we shouldn't consider the G20 presidency alone. 2021 for Italy is a year Uh, that is uh, extremely important for various um, international multilateral initiatives. There is the G20, but there is also the co-presidency -presid of uh, COP26, but there is also the Global Health Summit. Uh, and these three events will take place in Italy uh, and will need Italian leadership. And I'm saying this because um, it doesn't happen often, uh, such an overlap, and certainly it never happens with uh, such an authoritative prime minister as Mario Draghi, which can dent uh, into a specific agenda during this presidency. Uh, secondly, uh, so, so it, it will be an occasion for Italy to play a role which helps those of us that uh, say that a multilateral organization of things work better than, um, let's say, a bilateral or transactional uh, organization of uh, international relations. 
And of course, this uh, overlapping of international events offers Italy the possibility to push forward an idea of our role in the world, of Europe's uh, role in the world, of the need for multilateral organizations. Um, this is not uh, the standard jargon. Uh, it is something that Italy knows very well. Uh, we are not uh, a very strong military power. We have convening power, and we should make this convening power work even if, as Simon was saying, uh, on the one hand, multilateralism is needed, but on the other hand, there are powerful forces at work against multilateralism. Second issue, uh, what is on the menu? There is this issue of vaccination, which is a big issue. And really, I would like to stress the fact that Europe is the only international player that is playing uh, uh, a game of cooperation against uh, other players that are playing a game of competition. Uh, there was a splendid article on Il Foglio a few days ago by Paola Peduzzi explaining exactly this. Europe is the only global player that on the vaccination game hasn't uh, fallen into the prisoner's dilemma. But since we are alone, in the end, we are those that uh, are suffering from playing co cooperatively rather than uh, in a competition. At the same time, um, this uh, vaccination nationalism and this competition over, over vaccination should make us think as Europeans really well on the strengths and on the weaknesses of our system. And um, the fact that uh, um, we play by the rules, that our citizens uh, are aware and interested in playing by the rules, uh, uh, might make us weaker in a G20 context, which plays by different rules, even with a different US presidency. Third, uh, what, okay, this is first issue on the menu, vaccination, vaccine nationalism, and so on. Uh, second thing, geopolitics connected to vaccination. At uh, the Munich Security Conference this year, which was uh, uh, streamed online, uh, it was very clear that there is a huge geopolitical game connected to the recovery after the virus, which is connected to the geopolitics of vaccination, but also to the geopolitics of uh, um, the recovery of trade and uh, the recovery of the global economy. We should be ready to catch up on that. And I think we, uh, at least as Western countries or as European countries, we're a bit rusty on this kind of games. We haven't thought about what is happening around us very thoroughly. Uh, and I think about uh, areas which I know better, for example, what is happening in the Horn. Today, there was a very uh, uh, hard declaration by President Al-Sisi on the, on, the on the Nile, uh, the conflict uh, within Ethiopia are worrying signs of the fact that we haven't taken care uh, of our neighborhoods, and we should, we should quickly, because there is a huge geopolitical game that is on the making, and we're probably not ready for that. And uh, of course, uh, the G20 is not uh, the UN General Assembly in September, but certainly is a place where these issues will be discussed, and where issues of health, economy, and trade will be discussed and will shape the future. Again, on the menu, there is this huge issue of uh, um, environmental transition. And uh, there we are all doing our share. Uh, but politically, um, we shouldn't uh, let um, the recovery plan and the next generation EU and all the other uh, things that we are discussing 
uh, be felt by our citizens only as like um, a menu that uh, is very technocratic. There is a risk of citizens feeling like they are facing a huge transformation, which is the climate change and the, 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 the environmental transition. And they are not part of it. They're, they're subject to it, but they're not part of this change. This politically in democracy is a great risk. We should not run, we should not run this risk. Fourth issue on the menu, uh, it is a kind of a side event to the G20, but we shouldn't forget it, is this confrontation between democracies and autocracies. I, I am sorry to say that the biggest and more threatening of, uh, autocracy in the world, which is China, fared a lot better than the two uh, blocks of democracies in the face of COVID. This is a, geo a huge geopolitical issue, which questions the way in democracy we respond to problems. We shouldn't underestimate this huge geopolitical thing, geopolitical risk. Um, China uh, emerges unscattered or okay, with a tarnished um, reputation, but stronger than ever from We don't. Biden was elected, democracies can correct themselves, but we should really think about what happened and how we make our institutions stronger, how we make our citizens part of the change, how we listen better. Because otherwise the risk is that after all, in one, two, three years, there will be a great appetite for autocratic um, solutions in our societies. Our citizens have willingly given to the state part of their freedom, uh, if the state can protect them from the, from the pandemic. They are ready to do that. So they are ready to go for solution, solutions uh, that are more autocratic and they, they've tried that. Uh, this is extremely dangerous if we do not fix our democratic systems. So these, these are a, a couple of ideas that uh, I, I wanted to feed into a debate on, uh, on the G20. And I hope this is uh, useful. I think I will go do an interview and come back if it's all right, Carlo. Yes, of course. Sorry. <clears throat> Okay, then see you later. Ciao. Okay, thank you very much, Leah. See you in a while. Um, I will uh, now call uh, uh, Alberto Mingardi uh, to, to give a contribution to, to this debate. Um, of course, it's, it's a little bit strange for me to, to ask a question to my boss. Uh, so my, my question would be, so would, you you, shouldn't. would you raise my salary? But, but I'm not sure this is... Uh, well, the answer uh, is, is all the it. same, no. <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I think uh, uh, Alberto might want to, to address, I mean, we, we have uh, heard from Simon uh, uh, the big picture of, of what uh, is at stake at the G20. And we have heard uh, the, the perspective of the government and of, of uh, a, a policymaker, uh, a, a, an MP. So a, as a representative from a free market think tank like we are, uh, where do you see uh, the greater risks and what do you think can, can, can be done in the context of the G20 to, to address all of the big issues we are surrounded by? Personally, I will actually be more than happy with Simon's first point, which is stop uh, matters getting worse. I think there will be a great accomplishment for the next G20. Uh, I think Simon has given a splendid talk. Um, really, you know, I'm, I'm a natural pessimist. So in a way, I was quite pleased uh, in learning that some of 2020 changes uh, were for the better and not all of them for the worse. Uh, in many ways, I think 2020 will be remembered as a tremendous year of resilience for global trade. I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, we confronted scenarios 
uh, that predicted a minus 30% uh, of global trade in one year. So reality has been quite different. And, and that is something to be very pleased with. And also, I think uh, Mr. Modiano's point was right. This is actually proven uh, the viability of some multilateral arrangements. And, uh, you know, in, in some way, the, the complexities of um, the illegal infrastructure of global trade is, uh, has proved to be a virtue uh, in, in these years. I think a very important point was raised by Simon uh, has to do with the difference in which uh, different countries dealt with the crisis. Uh, this is good. It would be better if we actually could learn something out of it, but countries are not necessarily extremely good at that. Um, in some sense, you know, my impression is that, as always, uh, generals uh, fight the last war. Uh, so lots of um, strategies to cope with the problem that the pandemic raised uh, were actually uh, targeted and attuned uh, to the sort of problems that we saw in the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis and the debt crisis after that. Uh, so we focused on, on, on the need for spending. Uh, and instead, the pandemic produced, and, and the responses to the pandemic produced, instead, particular challenges that needed different instruments, that need this an instrument to be addressed. Uh, I have two points that are, in a sense, questions or, or things I'd like Simon to elaborate on a bit. The first one is the posture uh, of the European Union uh, in the current scenario. Now, I understand that by asking him to elaborate on that, I may be carrying coal to Newcastle. Um, but nonetheless, I think that, uh, you know, the present status of the debate uh, with vaccine nationalism being at the center of the scene, which is totally understandable, exactly in the light of the disease of contemporary democracies uh, that Lea Quattopelli alluded to, uh, still, you know, is, is, is clearly changing the perception of the EU uh, also outside its own boundaries. Now, vaccine nationalism, in a sense, is contradictory and self-defying. Uh, this is a point that was raised by Commissioner Breton uh, in an interview with Correa della Sera a few weeks ago. Uh, in that interview, he pointed out that really vaccine themselves are the product of a very extensive international cooperation. So uh, vaccine nationalism is not particularly good for anybody. Uh, but still, clearly, that's the center of the political debate. And it, it tells us a lot about the dynamic of the political debate that, you know, whenever something is approaching to the center, you need to come up uh, with uh, slogans and words uh, that allude to um, higher involvement of governments and clearly uh, some degree of quote unquote protection. Uh, so uh, more than the national public debate, which I think is, is worrisome nonetheless, uh, uh, I, I really um, fear about how the EU is coming out of this. Uh, and now, you know, this change in our reputation may affect um, perspective for global trade uh, altogether. The second point uh, I'd like to raise, I'd like uh, to assignment to elaborate on, is that I suspect that to paraphrase Bismarck, uh, import bans like sausages, cheese to inspire respect in proportion as we know how they're made. Um, I'm afraid that the circumstances last year were exceptional, uh, but I think that politics was pretty much the same as ever. And what happened plenty of times was simply that some special interests were particularly capable or apt in smuggling their own needs under the flag of protection and national interest. So I wonder if in uh, Simon's agenda for the next G20, so to say, uh, should not there be a place for something like, you know, 
best practices for quote unquote internal multilateralism by which I mean uh, improvement uh, in the policy process uh, by which we can try to have a better private sector involvement and by a better private sector involvement in shaping the measures I actually mean you know having a political process that doesn't work in a way uh, such as uh, the only private interests that are actually heard are those uh, that are consistently more capable of capturing politicians. Uh, so that's it. These are my two uh, uh, points I'd like um, to um, be enlightened upon uh, by Professor Evnit. Thank you very much, Alberto. And last question and last speaker uh, is Cristina Falcone from UPS. Um, uh, Alberto uh, expressed the view of, of a free market think tank of a, a, an intellectual. You have, so to speak, your boots on the ground in terms of international trade and, and making everything possible in, in, in our today's life. Uh, so what is your, your, your perspective on the debate uh, uh, within the G20 and beyond the G20, of course? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for the, uh, the insightful interventions. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity, and this is uh, the last uh, in the series of the webinars dedicated to the new world that's emerging after COVID-19 to sum up what UPS as a global company are witnessing um, as the post-pandemic order overall. Now, as an essential service provider, we've been operating and involved in the global pandemic response efforts right from the start. This ranges from the ongoing vaccine rollout to the support of an inclusive economic recovery, keeping people safe at home while delivering them e-commerce goods and keeping supply chains going for essential businesses. We know that the Italian presidency will focus on the three priorities, of course, of people, planet, and prosperity. And we feel that our experience is operating since the, the beginning of the pandemic uh, fully aligns with these objectives. We have to acknowledge, though, that it's been discussed already that the pandemic isn't over. We continue to be in a state of global uncertainty. This is worsened by the economic crisis generated by the pandemic. And there's been many remarks talking about how this is fueling political and geoeconomic tension. It's also increasing the social gap of certain segments of society that have been more impacted. Um, fortunately, democratic institutions show they are stable enough to collaborate and react. I mean, I think we've highlighted some very positive outcomes that you know, have demonstrated that uh, we've been able to achieve some success here. The EU demonstrated this as well with the creation of the next generation EU fund. Um, the US election shows some, some promise in terms of a change of pace and how do we engage and interact internationally, important player at the table. But I would like to just highlight, you know, I think five big trends that we have certainly seen accelerate through this pandemic and what we would provide as our recommendations um, to Italy as it takes on um, the, the presidency and also for the G20 for cooperation on how to address these, these trends, the challenges that they bring and the opportunities. First is the rise of business to consumer and e-commerce in terms of business. This is not slowing down. So we knew that these trends were, were coming. I mean, UPS was preparing for this, but when everyone was suddenly locked in their homes, you know, all of a sudden you had everyone trying e-commerce and that just propelled the acceleration of uh, the adoption of using the digital market. You know, people of all age segments. What does this mean? It impacts overall supply chain models, profitability margins for companies, you know, everything is getting shifted around because of people getting engaged, you know, in, in this market space. Companies need to, to adapt. Um, and especially this uh, involves couriers. We had a, another webinar on this in terms of how do we deliver sustainably, but also in a way that our customers continue to be profitable uh, as well, because the pressure is there. Um, it also means that the widest number of companies, especially small to medium-sized businesses, now through the digital market have access to the to the greatest international market without having to put brick and mortar in. and so you know we're undergoing uh, i mean we've certainly seen this that companies that were able to transition to e-commerce companies that were able to transition to e-commerce were the ones that were able to survive and even be quite successful so we see a very unique opportunity here 
And we also see this as an opportunity to address those impacted aspects of society. For example, women entrepreneurs, because if we get them involved into this digital market space, then um, we can help address this economic recovery. And it also helps to, um, to support the local, the local economies as well, because they tend to also reinvest uh, in the economy, which is why we're running a women's exporters program globally to provide those simple tips on how to uh, enable women to get engaged in e-commerce. And so, you know, facilitating e-commerce globally is going to be very important. And we see, you know, unique opportunities to advance this through the WTO, for example, with the e-commerce agreement. This is very important um, from our perspective because it's probably the biggest trend that we've seen um, accelerate. Um, tied into that, the digital transition has started. And of course, we support the continuation of, of this transition. How can we move forward in, in technology? tools, for example, as Mr. Mondiano uh, explained, how do we go forward for the future in this? And also, how does the public administration procedures also enable technology in, in terms of their de dealing with businesses? This is important. Third, uh, critical would be to establish flexible working infrastructure that can quickly adapt to emergency scenarios and provide immediate support to business. And you know, we cannot achieve this if we continue to have unilateralism. You know, um, I, I've often, I was sometimes afraid to open the global trade uh, alerts to see what new tariffs were coming in or how things were evolving over this pandemic. Um, but certainly, you know, a, a level of cooperation to manage supply chains will be critical. UPS, for example, since 2020, we delivered 20 million pounds of PPE worldwide. We delivered over 93 million doses uh, vaccines over to 46 countries. And by the end of this year, we expect to deliver 3 billion vaccine doses. Um, and so contextually, all countries must guarantee the adoption of non-restrictive measures, guaranteeing freedom and security of movement. One of the biggest tools that we saw was effective with this was the EU green lanes, where that enabled continuation of supply chain within the, within the single market, while also um, protecting citizens. And that was critical to movement of these, um, of these goods, also to keep the economy running. But that's the EU. I mean, we need to take a look at how do the networks for airlines operate worldwide? What will be these protocols that we continue to keep in, in place? Fourth, there's tremendous value in public-private partnerships to tackle challenges of all types. And again, this was highlighted in the previous interventions. UPS, we're doing in, this, in the US with warp speed operation and in collaboration with COVAX, and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and CARE, facilitating delivery of 20 million doses for countries that have not had sufficient access to vaccines. Um, three Ps are a vital component in building global solutions for global challenges. And as Mr. Mondiano remarked, you know, we, we have a real opportunity now multilaterally you know, to be less reactive moving forward, to take a look at what have we learned and how can we build the right protocol so that in the future, we can continue to address challenges and crises as, as they arise based on these learnings. And certainly protocol um, in terms of partnership when business works with governments to tackle solutions, you know, even at a multilateral level, level we, can, we can do great things. When it comes down to it, we wanna get something done and the collaboration and the, and the willingness is there, it, it, it can happen. And, and certainly businesses are willing to put their, their uh, their hand at the table to help with this. Finally, any new flexible working infrastructures must be time-proof and they must be based on sustainable processes. We know that you know, now we've got some more momentum, especially um, you know, with the, the new administration in the US to tackle climate change. And so as we're looking at all these measures, we, know we need to operate these in a very sustainable way to keep the networks um, operating in a way that also protects our planet. And so that's why, you know, we feel with this, with this final webinar that the G20 was, was a perfect topic um, to choose to, to, to reflect after one year of the pandemic to define the pillars for what our structural recovery process will be. And uh, we see that the Italian presidency is certainly focused on, on doing so, and we continue to, to encourage that. I was really pleased to hear, you know, the focus on reforming the WTO organization a, as a whole reforming the dispute resolution mechanism and negotiation function. I mean, we see this, these are critical, you know, it seems technical, but when it comes to businesses operating on the ground, 
transport companies like us, but also all the small to medium sized businesses, um, the, the, the strength of the, the WTO is, is critical. And so um, protecting competitiveness of the market and ensuring level playing field among the states through this mechanism. A uh, fundamental step, as I mentioned, is the e-commerce joint initiative, which helps to, to overcome some of these. Uh, we need to overcome some of the doubts and critics proposed by some states on, on this uh, mechanism. And we hope that the newly appointed WTO Director General will act this way. And we hope that we can continue to champion that. We also believe that you know, the EU can play a fundamental role in this new post-pandemic order. Um, they have published their new renewed trade strategy. And we keep reinforcing, they've said, open strategic autonomy. And so that's quite important. UPS is reinforcing, we cannot look back and become protectionist. You know, the EU must relaunch its relationship with the US and also help to lead this reform of the WTO and foster greater multilateral uh, inclusiveness and negotiations as they also negotiate FTAs moving forward. We hope that these, these five challenges um, you know, our, we, we do believe that these are challenges, these are trends, but in each of these challenges, there's, there's opportunities. And so, you know, UPS is right here to, to help to continue to provide uh, our experience and, and our learnings uh, to weigh in to tackle these challenges on the longer term. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, I go back to, to, to Simon. Uh, I think we are a little bit long uh, with regard to, to the timing we had in mind originally. So uh, I, I will ask all of you to, to, to uh, be very short right now. Um, so Simon, I, I, I think that uh, all of the uh, other speakers, all of the members of the roundtable raised uh, several interesting points related with, to, to, to your uh, initial speech. So you, you, you basically are free to pick any of their uh suggestions or points and to address them well i mean in listening to our colleagues i mean it, we had a, a very sort of positive set of uh, ideas and proposals we've just heard uh, uh, several um from our colleagues from ubs i mean in this sense if that's the spirit which infuses the g20 presidency of italy uh then it does cause for some optimism i agree so i'm i'm very heartened to hear that there were two specific questions put to me uh, by your boss, actually, so I'd better answer them, otherwise you'll get in trouble. Uh, so let me uh, let me do that. And actually, I think the answers to them are related. So the first uh, question is, what are we really learning about the, the politics uh, of the EU as we went through this process? And I think, for me, the biggest uh, reflection was just how quickly the health policy makers uh, in each country and potentially in Brussels, um, very quickly dominated the debate and swamped the trade policy concerns. And so uh, uh, we had um, policymakers, health policymakers, I think, arguing for export controls on PPE and masks, um, and, you know, essentially thinking in zero sum terms and showing absolutely no appreciation of international supply chains and their consequences. And I think one of the things I take from that is, uh, you know, we've always knew that trade policymakers are relatively weaker compared to many other, uh, many other uh, branches of government. Uh, but the trade policymakers, I think, were either outmaneuvered or are unable to fight back against some of the uh, less, in, less in enlightened health policy um, suggestions. So my, one conclusion I take from that is that health policymakers make for bad trade policymakers. Um, and that's uh, now, I think the Next question, really, the deeper question is why um, are that? Why were the health policymakers so uh, prominent? You can say, of course, there's a pandemic, but actually, I think it speaks to something deeper. And maybe Alberto was hinting at this, which is that in Europe, we uh, we allow fear to drive decision making extraordinarily, and to a degree which um, is I actually now that I reflect on uh, my travels around the world over the years. Um, it is extraordinary the extent to which the precautionary principle is actually a euphemism for rule by fear and i wonder if that is something we we need to rebalance this and 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 uh, and not think just only in defense in defensive terms and then um uh, you know, the second point which he asked was uh, well what are the better practices for internal multilateralism well i think uh, a counterbalance to rule by fear is the answer, which is uh, 
you know, we can't have public policy responses during a pandemic which are ignorant of supply chains. We can't have public, we can't have people devising vaccine export authorization regimes who are unaware of the, um, the you know the intricate supply chains and the dependence of the European Union on on supplies of vaccine ingredients from abroad. And so um, either the trade policymakers need to raise their game, the health policymakers need to raise their game, or the, pe or the people they respond to should demand more. Uh, because I think we need a much more informed uh, set of decision making. So I think that would be, I think, my attempt to try and answer your boss's questions. Thank you very much, Simon, for saving my, my job, basically. Uh, um, I, 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 I switch to, to Director Modiano. Um, I think that many, uh, basically all of the speakers today, including yourself, has, uh, have raised the issue of the future of multilateralism uh, in, in this, this, this time. Uh, multilateralism has been in crisis, or at least it's not been doing very well for, for some time. Uh, but with the pandemics, two opposite forces came out. On, on one hand, there was a sense of belonging to, to the same, uh, just one humanity. I mean, we, we all have the same problem and you, we have to deal with it jointly. But at the same time, as Simon showed very eloquently, uh, also nationalism and, and uh, selfishness to some extent emerged. Um, has the president of, G, of, the, of this G20, how do you think you can, I mean, strengthen the former, the, the good side of, of what we have uh, experienced in these past few months and opposing the, the, the nationalism and disgregationalist forces? Thank you very much. Yeah, there are many very interesting elements emerging from the debate uh, and then that. But I think that uh, when, when we go through the debate between uh, unilateralism and multilateralism, I think, I think we are making an enormous error here. Uh, my, my feeling is that we don't have any alternative. I mean, if we, we, if we have to, to face a pandemic or, or if we have to face climate change, we have to fight climate change or we, or we have to manage migration. These are global challenges. We don't have any alternative if not dealing with them from a multilateral point of view. So the point is not uh, uh, the option between unilateralism and, and multilateralism. The point is that we have to reform multilateralism so that it could uh, better and more appropriately deal with this uh, phenomenon, which are global challenges. There's no way of whatever, whatever country you are, even the most powerful one, you don't have any chance. So here, the, the debate should be, for example, the WTO, it's not a matter of uh, protectionism or uh, free trade. The, the, the free trade is, of course, uh, a tool that we have to guarantee prosperity to our people. So the thing is that if the WTO is, the WTO is not working properly, so we have to reform the WTO. And if we want to deal with climate change, we have to uh, you know, uh, work all together within the multilateral context to fight against climate change. So from this point of view, I think, as I said before, uh, the experience of the pandemic has is, is been extremely useful from this point of view, because it gave us a clear picture of the only way we have to face global challenges. It, it, and, and I perfectly know that sometimes it's very difficult to see uh, and to touch with hands the capacity of delivering of, uh, of the global fora, for example. But uh, again, the point is not, uh, uh, okay, we have to go we have, to, we have another option. No, we have the global fora, we have to let them work properly. And we have, and I think that at least from this point of view, the Italian presidency is doing its best effort to guarantee that uh, uh, in a very important year as 2021, uh, we can use the global fora that we have to uh, properly face global challenges such as pandemic. And as I said, and as I said before, the, the success that we had in terms of uh, finding vaccines and distributing them, whatever difficulties we are facing at the moment, in any case, it's a great success. I mean, it's a great demonstration that the global, the global, the multilateralism can work properly. Of course, we have a lot to do to make it working more uh, efficiently, but I think that we don't have an alternative. And so we are working 
with with this. I mean, we know we we had to work in this context, and we have at least to make a great effort to reform it. But we don't have any other options. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, Leah uh, is not back yet, so I switch to to, to Alberto. I mean, uh, after uh, this this. Uh, the points that, that both Director Modiano and uh, Simon have raised, uh, partly in, in uh, responding to your own questions earlier. Uh, would you say you are more or less optimistic about, I mean, the, the, the opportunities and potentialities of this G20 in, in given the real world constraints? Well, it's difficult to say, of course, it is a seminar, so uh, I think we have a substantial uh, agreement between us on a, on a variety of issues and the world outside this uh, um, Zoom room, I mean, is, is quite different, alas, than, um, uh, than the consensus we experience here. Um, I would just like to... Uh, you know, make a very short point concerning, um, I think, uh, Simon's enlightening uh, answer. Yes, the politics of fear uh, of, mm -hmm. well, embedded in, in, among many other things, the precautionary principle. But uh, I, I just wonder, you know, if, uh, if perhaps, uh, you know, lots of attitude that we see in the political class and among decision makers are not just shaped uh, by demographic trends. So uh, even though Europe is clearly experiencing uh, some of the many positive trends that Christina Falcone, for example, uh, reminded us about before, I mean, the um, transformations were not exclusively uh, for worse last year. Uh, we're old and um, the consensus we face is a consensus of people that are looking backwards, uh, that fear change, um, and they are extremely conservative uh, in some of their deep-rooted um, political attitudes. And I think up to a certain extent, uh, politics cannot but reflect this fact. Uh, of course, it's not homogeneous. I and mean, the Netherlands is not um, Italy, Italy is not France, uh, France is not Germany. Uh, but I wonder if that is not uh, perhaps the unifying uh, factor that we see at work uh, in, in Europe these days. Thank you, Alberto. And uh, I, I uh, go back to Christina for my last question of, of today's webinar. Uh, um, I mean, our very lives, you know, to some extent, are in the hands of the couriers uh, that are managing all of the uh, healthcare and vaccine logistics. Um, what do you expect from, from uh, well, do you expect uh, that the G20 or any other uh, international forum in the short run uh, will uh, do or can do anything to ease your job and, and improve the ability of the uh, war to, to produce and share and distribute vaccines? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I mean, one of the biggest things for us is having security that as we move these vaccines internationally, we're not going to have surprises in terms of new regulations, restrictions, requirements, as you can imagine, when you're moving things that are as sensitive as these vaccines, that is critical. And when you get a change overnight in terms of what is the protocol to manage a variant for entry of the pilots, you know, et cetera, this can just create, um, it could create chaos. Now, um, that's what our team has been very, you know, busy on, on navigating. So we've put specific recommendations um, you know, for example, to the uh, WTO, to the WHO, in terms of cooperation on protocol for movement of the vaccines, health corridors, for example, for movement uh, on air, for entry on air. So harmonizing as much as possible, how do we handle this crisis and keeping communities safe while keeping the supply chain moving through a harmonized process will ensure that we can have a smooth end-to-end process without jeopardizing communities. I would say that's going to be critical. 
Thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers for for allowing us to to uh, uh, be on time for for closing the webinar. Uh, let me sincerely say thank you for your great contributions to the debate. Uh, let me say thanks to uh, all of those who have been following us uh, uh, on, on in streaming, as well as to uh, all of those who will uh, um, get connected to the uh, YouTube channel of Istituto Brunleoni, where the debate will be available uh, from tomorrow. Um, finally, I switch back to Italian. The, uh, questo è eh, l'evento conclusivo eh, di un ciclo che l'Istituto Bruno Leoni ha organizzato eh, in collaborazione con UPS, che eh, ringraziamo davvero di cuore per averci consentito di affrontare temi così importanti. Eh, lo ricordo, negli incontri precedenti abbiamo discusso dell'outlook eh, del commercio internazionale, abbiamo parlato di e-commerce, abbiamo parlato eh, della logistica healthcare, inclusi i vaccini, e oggi abbiamo discusso delle prospettive del G20. Tutti questi eh, incontri possono essere eh, visti e seguiti sul canale YouTube dell'Istituto Bruno Leoni e quindi eh, approfittatene perché ne vale la pena e, e grazie ancora per averci seguito e continuate a seguire l'Istituto per eh, sapere delle nostre prossime attività. Grazie e buona serata. Grazie mille, buona grazie. serata a tutti. Arrivederci.